So, funny story. Uh, yesterday, I was walking in the streets of Budapest, uh, admiring the architecture. And I wasn't paying attention to the cobblestones, and I fell and actually broke my arm. <laughs> No, but it's okay, because this is good, because I think people tell you when you're about to get on stage, like, break a leg, and I broke my arm, and I feel like this is going to mean that this is going to be the most amazing talk ever. But I'm not here to talk about how clumsy I am, even though that would be pretty funny. Um, I'm here to talk about the shady web and how we can use our CSS powers for good and not evil. Oh, one second. All right, so what that looks like is we're going to first talk about how frustrating the web is today. Um, and then we're going to talk about how we can be intentional about our strategies that we use to make our web more functional. And then lastly, some steps to bring that back home and actually get your web more animated. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Heidi. I'm an American from Portland, Oregon, and a senior for a full-service agency called Eroy. At Eroy, we work with clients like Nike and Taco Bell and some other American ones that you probably don't know about. Um, and my Twitter handle is here, as well as well my code pen, so if you want to follow me and ask me questions there, please feel free. But um, like you said, I've been a developer for about nine or ten years, and when I first got into development, I was so excited to learn everything. Um, first I learned HTML and CSS, and then I saw that other websites had these cool slideshows that they used jQuery, and so I was like, yeah, I want to learn jQuery. But then I realized that I didn't understand how jQuery worked at all, so I learned JavaScript. And then I wanted to use data in my site, so I learned PHP. And all this was fine and good, but a couple years in, I kind of realized that I didn't really like anything I was making. It was, you know, they looked nice, they were functional, but something was missing. And I realized that all the other developers that I was following were doing some really cool concepting, some really cool um, executions, and I was like, man, what am I missing? And I realized that I've been focused so much on how to do the things that I didn't really think about why I was actually doing it. And I think this contributes a lot to why the web is so frustrating. And I think that we're all kind of guilty of this a little bit. For example, <laughs> this probably happened to you a lot. You're reading a blog, you're like halfway through, you're getting to the good meat of it, and all of a sudden this video pops up and it starts playing music. Now imagine you're at work and your headphones are not in, and all of a sudden your whole work knows that you're procrastinating and not working. Super frustrating. My probably least favorite experience is if you're on a mobile device, right? So you start you know, struggling through the blog, and then all of a sudden this ad comes up, and you have to scroll carefully to get to the top. And if you accidentally tap it, you're going to another site, and then you know, you're not going to come back. And this is so frustrating. And the problem is, is that people like us are making those experiences. We're the ones who are guilty. And you know, developers get really mad about that. And I think I just want to give developers the benefit of the doubt. Like, maybe they're not evil people. Like, maybe they just don't intend to make these experiences so awful. And I think there's two things that happen. I think the first is that we abuse new technologies until a more sophisticated way of doing things emerges, right? We like the shiny, brand new things. And I'm definitely guilty of this. When CSS animations were starting to get supported, I was like, woohoo, like animate all the things. It's like a party in my browser. But the problem was is that people weren't coming to the sites I was developing to like look at the cool things that I was animating. They were actually there to do a thing, and I was just getting in the way of that. The second thing that I think happens is that we prioritize like business goals and metrics over the user experience. Uh, take pop-ups, for example. Really common use to get email acquisition. And there's a lot of blog posts that talk about how successful they are, right? You get like 20 or 30% more emails, woohoo! But everybody hates them, so why are we using them? Well, I think it's a I think that the illusion that you do get those emails, but there's actually a couple things that are happening. You're getting in the way of the person's task that they're trying to complete. And so even if they go past your pop-up, they're going to be frustrated with you and maybe not come back to your site. Also, people are going to put fake email addresses in there. It's going to be like fart at fart.com.edu or whatever. And just to get past that, because and then you, know, you have fake emails in your list. And then let's say they're nice people and they actually give you their real email address. When those people receive an email from you, they're going to be like, I don't, they're not going to open it because they didn't really choose to do that in the first place. 
And so you've all seen this quote before, I think maybe like a million presentations have had it, but it's a really good quote. Good design when done well becomes invisible. And that's because we need to get out of the way of our users and let them create the function at hand. So that's what we really want to talk about being intentional. And I think this is really important when you think about CSS animations because a lot of times they're used for decoration. So is that getting in the way? Is there even a use for using animation at all? And I actually argue yes, because animation is a really unique way to make the user feel like it's something that's in real life. So for example, this is Ryan Gosling. Um, he's receiving some information, pausing, and then shaking his head. And without even understanding or hearing anything that he's doing, you understand that he does not agree with whatever was told to him. Now, look at this example from Stripe Checkout. The user is trying to submit without filling out the fields. So in addition to just outlining the fields with red, which is common practice, it's actually shaking, like no. And that's universally known, so it's helping the user understand, oh, I messed up. I need to do something before this submits. And this is because what happens when um, you're reducing what's called cognitive load. And so cognitive load refers to the total amount of information your working memory can handle. And so this is how this works. Every day you receive so much sensory information, stuff that you can feel or you see or you hear, and your sensory memory actually stores the most important information in your cognitive load. But what can also happen is when you receive so much information that your sensory memory can't distinguish what's the most important. And this is when you become really frustrated and decisions are really hard to make. This awesome dude, Professor John Sweller, um, actually did a lot of studies about cognitive load theory. And with that, he figured out a couple different strategies to help um, create these techniques to help people learn. So three of these strategies that we can use in the web are show and tell, connecting context, and call and response. Studies have shown that people respond better to image and narration versus text and narration. This is why seasoned speakers encourage you not to have a giant wall of text on a slide because the audience will attempt to read the slide while listening to you and get distracted. Here's an actual good example of it. This is a blog post about group texting um, in a really crazy climate. I'm sure you understand that states are a little frustrating right now. Um, so instead of just having a blog post with you know, text and some images, they're actually showing group text to help incorporate into that narration. It really helps you understand exactly what they're trying to communicate a lot easier than trying to read those blocks of text. The second concept is connecting context. So let's say you have a cat. I have two. And you see it coming around the corner, and then all of a sudden it looks behind it real, real quick. And then you're like, oh god, what is it? And so you start to create a mental model of what you think is happening based off of whatever you're seeing. It's not based necessarily on fact, but you need to inform yourself of the action you're going to take next. And so you might be like, oh no, is there a mouse? Even though it's just a cat and cats are just weird, and they do what they want. And this is really important for the web because there's so many different screen sizes. When I first started making websites, it was so awesome because it was like 800 by 600, go, we're good. But now it's just impossible to create one experience for one screen size. And so you're going to often have a lot of stuff that's off screen that you're going to need to let the user know that exists. So um, these are a couple examples from Google Material Design. And in this first example, you can see that when the user taps on the name, it reloads a new page. Now, this is fine when it's just one, in, like, one situation like that. But imagine if you keep going down a rabbit hole and you don't understand where you are. So in the second example, which is using animation to help connect that context, when you click on the name, it's actually showing um, where that content is coming from. And so you just already start to know where you need to go back to. And this last strategy is called call and response. So this is really important because let's say you're driving a car. You accelerate, and the car goes faster. You brake, and the car goes slower. But imagine if you never had an odometer and how scary that would be because you would press the pedal, you're like, I think it's going to stop, or you, know, you might be accelerating. And this is really um, important for animation because you can really provide feedback. So let's say someone submits a form. You can let them know what the current status is the outcome, and then what the future status is. And with using all these parameters, we can, or these strategies rather, we can really start to make a more functional web. 
And so when we start to want to incorporate these into our work and making sure we're using it for good and not evil, we need to identify the problems that animation can solve. So the first problem that we can solve is I need to demonstrate the functionality of a new product. And I think oftentimes the way that people approach this is they'll either have like a video where you can see all the different features or they have a bunch of documentation. In this example by Chase, they actually have an entire pop-up that blocks the navigation and the content. And even more interesting, and I would love to know someone who works here, um, they have a CTA that says, see a slideshow. Like someone would actually want to see a slideshow about more of the features, but it's one way to execute it. Now, a better way to execute it is to use animation. And so I'll go ahead and play. This is a website for MailChimp. Um, what uh, MailChimp does is software that sends email campaigns. And they're promoting a new integration for Facebook ad campaigns. So as you're scrolling down the page, you can see that they do have a video where you can actually see the whole process. But if you're not convinced there, they can actually show you just little bits of animation coupled with text to show you what this functionality looks like. They're removing the non-essential content, and they're keeping these animations really short, so you're not going to have to sit there and watch the whole thing. Another example is ZoomCare. Um, ZoomCare is actually a convenient care clinic um, in the States, and so if you were to fall on a sidewalk in the United States, you would want to go to ZoomCare, and they would help you. And so the way that this one works, they wanted to promote their ab, app. <laughs> And as you scroll down, you can see that they're giving some like, little bits of information. But what's really cool is that they're actually fixing the mobile device. And as you scroll each different feature, they go ahead and show you in the app what that looks like. And this is really great because it's breaking this content into smaller digestible pieces. And they're placing the words really close to the animation that demonstrates it. So let's go on to another problem. I have a shopping cart on my website. And I think often websites, what they do is that you're on a product page, and you go ahead and add to cart, and then they actually bring you to a whole other page. And this is disruptive, because they're not really encouraging you to buy more products. They might recommend different products, but still, it's not, it's not keeping you in the experience. Whereas one of my favorite uh, t-shirt sites, um, once you go ahead and add to the shopping cart, a drawer will be revealed, and it shows you where that shopping cart is located. And then if you go up to the shopping cart icon, it will actually close it again. They have the same um, animation on the menu as well to keep it consistent. And so you start to remember, you start to learn, and you start to anticipate these actions. Let's look a little closer at the icons. Um, so when they're inactive, they're like the standard shopping cart icon that's very recognizable. Same with the hamburger menu. But when you hover over it, it shows you the direction that it's going to go. And then when it's active and you want to close it, it shows you that arrow as well. And so those cues for interaction are really important because it's, you're not going to want to, um, you want people to understand where these things are if they're off campus. And the last problem that we're going to solve, I need to let the user know that an action is taking place behind the scenes. And so let's say you have a form submit or you're trying to load um, screens in an app. Common thing is to just create a standard loading GIF. Now this is fine, but if your process is going to take any more than four seconds, people are going to get so frustrated with you, especially if you use a loading GIF like this. Because anybody who uses Mac knows what this means. It is like the wheel of death. And so you want to make it a little bit more um, like a progress bar, right? So you can virtually, visually confirm what's happening behind the scenes so you can tell them where they've been, what's currently happening, and what's about to happen. And according to studies, it feels 12% faster, even if it is the same amount of time. Another thing that's been really like, popular these days is skeleton screens. And it's interesting because there's actually like, conflicting information about it. A lot of people think it feels a lot faster because you're giving a hint of the content to come, so you know what to anticipate. But some people find it distracting because it's a new pattern that's just starting to emerge. And so I bet that you know, a couple months down the line when more apps are using this, it's going to feel more intuitive to the user, and it's going to feel a lot faster. And so those are all really great um, executions of it. But I think, as developers, we have a hard time bringing it back to practice at our workspaces. And so for this next part, I would like to go over some steps that have helped me bring it to my work. Common challenges that I think a lot of us have are time. Um, creating animation seems really time consuming. Um, and oftentimes, they come in late in the process, and we don't feel like we have enough time to 
give it its due diligence. Um, establishing process um, to create that language between you and the designers or any of the strategists um, can be complicated and also skill. Um, there's so much to learn um, and so many different options for it and it can be a little intimidating. So the first step is to start the discussion about animation early in the process. Um, oftentimes people treat animation as decoration, and so it comes like at the very end, like, ooh, we should make the hover state of a CTA animated, or ooh, we have a form submit, we should probably create an animated GIF. But you really want to couple it as far in advance as possible, but definitely after you start to talk about the animation or information architecture and start asking those questions like, what can animation help solve? The second step is to use storyboards to brainstorm ideas quickly. Now, this is not pretty, but this is a real thing that I've used to be able to create an animation. What's nice about it when you bring something to pen and paper is it's disposable. You don't get attached to it like you would if you created a prototype right away. And it's really easy to get a bunch of ideas out and to be able to work with others on it. Once you and the team feels really good about that, you can go ahead and create a prototype or a motion mock-up. And that could be a really good base of discussion because it's actually animated. There's a couple different tools that are really awesome for this. Um, the first tool, Framer and Principle, are kind of more drag and drop. So they're really great for like standard animations. Um, and they have um, a lower um, entry point. So like your designers can work in it as well. However, if you need to do something that's really custom, uh, you might want to look into something like GreenSock JavaScript, which is amazing. Um, but it is, you know, it does require understanding JavaScript. Um, for me, I just like opening up a code pen um, and creating a pen. I think it's really nice to be able to have all that code there and then to sit with the designers and the strategists and kind of noodle with it and make sure that the duration is good, the timing is good, et cetera. The next step, once you guys feel really good about where the animation is, is you want to test, test, and test some more. And there's two components to this. The first is you want to ask people who have not seen the animation before a couple questions. One, is it legible? And that's not even just text, but like, do you understand what's going on? Um, and second, how does it make you feel? You can really understand a lot about if your animation is creating anxiety or is creating calm or how that feels by asking that question. And these questions are really important because the more you work with the animation, the more you're going to start to think that it's too slow because you already know what it's going to say. Um, and then secondarily, if people are you know, not sure if they want to animate something, A-B test to validate those decisions. Fifth, um, once you actually decide to ship, go ahead and document those design, 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 decisions, design decisions in your digital style guide. Um, so if you have a digital style guide, which you should, you can go ahead and document those decisions in it. It's really important when you do this to show what you have done and what you've already tried and you don't want to do. That'll help other developers in the future make good decisions. You also want to provide code snippets that include the duration, easing, and timing, because that's going to help make the animations a lot more efficient when they build new modules. And then you also want to establish naming conventions. Um, it's, you know how messy it can get if not everyone's on the same page. But especially with animation, to create classes that are meaningful um, will help a lot. And then lastly, keep learning and have fun. Here's a lot of resources that I've used to help educate me. Um, and I'll be putting these slides online, so don't worry about like, keeping track of that. And that's it for me. Go to Noam. Thank you. Thank you.